Hi everybody, welcome to IndyCar Monday the 6th of July 2018. I'm Gordon Ross and in the news today uh, it's a little bit of old news I'm afraid because unfortunately IndyCar couldn't broadcast yesterday just due to the fact that I had to work. So today's edition is a, a kind of mix of yesterday's news, Sunday's edition and Monday's. However, in the news today uh, are the comments made <coughs> by Dr. Liam Fox, <coughs> pardon me, Dr. Liam Fox of the Conservative Party, about the likelihood of Brexit uh, degenerating into a no-deal situation. He was quoted as saying that he now felt that the likelihood of there being no deal in Britain exiting in a chaotic manner without any trade deal after after Brexit was now about 60-40. In other words, 60% uh, of the likelihood that this would happen. Now, obviously, the Conservative Party have strenuously denied this and distanced themselves from this while Mrs May tries to, uh, to gain support from individual European leaders for her plans to circumvent the normal regulations and rules in, in involving the European Union so that Britain can get some kind of preferential treatment. Now added to that are the comments of the Bank of England uh, Director General Mark Carney this week who has also warned that he feels that a no-deal Brexit is now uncomfortably likely, those are his words, uncomfortably close and uh, he is now warning everybody that there is the risk of a deep recession and the possibility of inflation soaring above 4% for the first time in decades and also the, the fact that the pound is likely to devalue rapidly on news of a chaotic exit from the European Union. Now, <clears throat> just after Mark Carney made these comments the other day, there was a a significant fall in the value of the pound, something like 11 points wiped off the value of sterling against, uh, the, against the euro almost immediately, which is putting the pound at just around the equivalent of one euro at the moment. Now imagine if we did leave the European Union without any kind of trade deal in place at all with any of the European countries. We would be left with a 40% a gaping hole in their trade arrangements uh, generally. And that is a 40% gap, <coughs> pardon me, in our, in our economy that we need to be filled. A 40% drop in trade is a gigantic drop. And not only that, we have to start renegotiating uh, our deals with all of the countries of Europe, all of the countries surrounding uh, Europe as well. The Tories are doing their usual thing, uh, which is the typical uh, British attitude of exceptionalism, that they are somehow exceptionally entitled to a deal despite whatever the rules are that govern everybody else in Europe. And this is not going to happen. However, uh, Dr Fox has been laying the blame very firmly at the door of Michel Barnier and the European uh, Union in Brussels. He's saying it's their intransigence which may force Britain into a no-deal Brexit. Um, <clears throat> I beg to differ there. I think Britain has forced itself into a no-deal Brexit with its red lines. If it removed the red lines on immigration, for example, then a deal could be struck very easily. And uh, If they removed their restrictions on uh, on customs union as well, then that would make it even easier to trade. But all of these these red lines make it impossible for the European Union to do anything for Britain whatsoever. There's no way that Liam Fox is right when he says that the European Union is causing Britain to exit without a deal. It is Britain which is causing Britain to exit without a deal. And the Tories, as we always knew, are now going to cast around and try to blame Europe for the mess that they have got the country into. And this is known by virtually everybody in the United Kingdom now that the, the, the Conservative government has always been aiming for a hard Brexit. They have deliberately obfuscated and confused people and tried to uh, basically try to let let us think that there was a possibility of a deal with the European Union when they knew fine well because they had been told from the very outset after the Brexit deal, uh, after the Brexit vote was made, that there was no chance that Europe would bend the rules for the United Kingdom. Because 
if it bent the rules for the United Kingdom to allow them to have <clears throat> no freedom of movement, to allow them to stay out of the customs union, to allow them to stay out of um, the common market, to, to stay out of whatever it was they wanted to stay out of, they would have to do that for everybody and the whole European Union would be pointless. It wouldn't exist anymore because everybody would want the same exceptionalism that Britain is demanding. The United Kingdom needs to realise now that it's not a big player anymore. It's a, a country of 65 million people, which is soon to be 55 million people probably because Ireland, Scotland and Wales are getting pretty fed up with the way they're being treated as well. And certainly Scotland, I anticipate, will be leaving when uh, the full mess of Brexit becomes apparent to them. That will just leave uh, around about approximately 60 million people in England and Wales to deal with the mess that's been left in, with Brexit. And that is not of uh, Scotland's doing, it's not of the Scottish voters doing, we haven't voted for this. It's to do with English exceptionalism, the fact that they want to be treated differently, that they demand to be treated differently, that they believe they're so superior that they must have different treatment to every other country in Europe. And that's just simply not going to happen. Mrs May has been trying to finesse uh, Mr Macron over in France in an effort to try and turn him. And I think that is just a colossal waste of time because although they are similar in terms of their uh, political uh, alignments, that's where the similarity ends. Uh, France and Germany are the two biggest, staunchest, supporters and proponents of European integration that there are and Mrs Merkel wouldn't budge and I don't think Macron is going to budge either despite what Mrs May might say. The European Union remember can afford to lose the UK because it is so large that it will simply absorb that difference and will probably absorb another European country to take our place whereas the United Kingdom has nowhere to go with this. The only ally that we have is America, and it is blowing hot and cold at the moment about whether it will do a trade deal with us at all. And in fact, has already been clamping down on exports from Northern Ireland into the United States in the terms of aeroplanes which are being built, there are parts of them being built in Northern Ireland, and Trump has basically shut them out of the North American um, aircraft market completely with a 400% tax. That's not the action of somebody in a special relationship. That's the action of a total protectionist. And if America becomes totally protectionist, Britain will be on her own. What's left of Britain, that is. Now, in other, you, other news this week, uh, there is a story, uh, interestingly, in the Scotsman and the Herald last week, about a young uh, graduate from an English university who did a postdoc on uh, the idea of mining asteroids for platinum. And he was so convinced by the, the need to do this, to develop spacecraft, to look at what are known as near-Earth asteroids. These, these are rocky bodies which cross the orbit of the Earth on a periodic basis regularly uh, and would be within reach of a spacecraft to rendezvous with them. The idea would be to locate these uh, these rocky asteroids, scan them to see if they contain platinum, and any good ones would then be landed upon by a second spacecraft, which would mine that asteroid for all the platinum it had on board. A fairly small asteroid could be worth somewhere in the region of over 700 million pounds worth of platinum. Uh, that's if the spacecraft can be built. However, <coughs> What's happening is that this young man has got the help of um, the, the development agencies in Scotland and also has got in touch with various space companies in Glasgow who are now going to build the first of two spacecraft, one of which, the first one, will scan the asteroids, near-Earth ast asteroids, with a spectrograph which looks at, um, looks at what the asteroid is made of uh, to see if they can find asteroids which have a high level of platinum and would make them worth mining uh, and returning that platinum to Earth, where it is, of course, extraordinarily valuable. So this is one of the very first ever uh, commercialised mining operations in space ever to, to take place, and it's going to happen here in Glasgow. So watch this space, if you're pardon the pun, and I'll try and bring you more news on that story um, as it develops. Now, finally today... 
there has been a great deal of upset, I think is the best way of putting this, about two land proposals in Scotland which are scheduled for development. One by a theme park company uh, trying to develop a new site at Loch Lomond uh, Shores and the other one a housing developer trying to build houses on the battlefield at Culloden. Now I've done a little bit more research on the Culloden site over the weekend and I've looked at the, the maps produced by Glasgow University and its geophysical team who looked for evidence, uh, both historical uh, evidence of the accounts of the battles, where they took place, where the soldiers were positioned, uh, where the various armies and battalions were positioned on the field, and the geophysical evidence and the metal detector evidence that showed where the battle took place. And it's clear from that that this new site to be developed for housing is right in the middle of the battlefield, right where the English lines began uh, and across a little bit of no man's land of where the Scottish forces faced them. So it seems that not only is this uh, a housing development built near to the battlefield, it's actually going to be built on top of the battlefield site. The problem was that this map, uh, this information on the extent of the battlefield was not made available to the Scottish Government when this application was made. The application was made on behalf of the, the company who wanted to build the houses. The planning officials at the time knocked it back. The company then went to the Scottish Government's reporter to ask if they could overrule it. But the company did not supply the up-to-date uh, map of the battlefield and therefore the Scottish reporters, the Scottish Government official, overrode the decision and said that the housing can go ahead. Now this is as far as I can glean from the research I've done over the weekend. There may be things wrong in this. I'm prepared to accept any corrections that people want to make. But my understanding is now that the Scottish Government overrode this decision based on wrong information about the extent of the size of the battlefield. And the problem also is that if this um, development, I think it's of 16 houses, I'll, I'll just check that later on, but it's a small number of luxury houses. If it goes ahead and it encroaches into this battlefield area in any way, it then creates a precedent for dozens of other developers to start encroaching into the battlefield site from all sides. And before long, the entire battlefield, which is a mass war grave where thousands of men died uh, for their king and country, by the way. Remember that the Jacobites were fighting for James. And despite the fact that it seemed to be almost a Scots versus English battle, it wasn't. It was the Jacobites fighting against the British forces. And some of the British forces consisted of some, I think two Scottish battalions, who were loyal to the British side. And it was the last major battle on Scottish soil, and it ended the, the Highland way of life forever, and it ushered in the, the final um, disaster of the Highland clearances. And this battle site is, is sacred to most people in Scotland as a war grave. It would be, um, it, it would be like building houses on the battlefield of the Somme. It, it's that level of importance to us. And yet the Scottish Government has an awkward situation on its hands where it has okayed or overridden a, a planning department's decision to knock back the initial development uh, and has okayed this but it's been based on faulty information and now the information has come to light we need to persuade the Scottish Government to put a halt to this completely and I think there has to be a moratorium of some sort on all building work around the Culloden site until a perimeter can be established by Historic Scotland over which nobody can build. There has to be some kind of fence or some kind of boundary put around that battlefield which preserves it for posterity because it's still not only a, a battle site, not only a war grave, but it's also a site of very special um, interest to the history of Scotland and also to the, um, the research into what happened that, on, on that battle and where it happened, what artefacts might still lie under the ground there. In the case of Loch Lomond, um, at the moment, as far as we can tell, uh, the Flamingoland development will go ahead because it's part of a regional plan that the Council set out a long time ago and the momentum is now with this plan 
uh, because of that, because it's it's been steamrolling through. But the problem, as far as I can see, is another precedent is being set where uh, a foreign, when I say foreign, a, a company from out with Scotland can come in and simply buy up or be given a piece of land within a national park to develop a massive, um, what looks to be a housing development of retirement flats with swimming pools and gymnasiums and all the rest of that, one or two glamping pods and perhaps a dozen or so um, holiday chalets. But we don't know what else is planned because there are other attractions unspecified, to, to quote the uh, articles and the plans that we've seen, which don't tell us what else Flamingo Land plans to put on the site. There was some talk of treetop walks, of zip lines, of um, forest canopy trails, but none of that appeared in any of the plans that I've seen. So the Scottish Government has a couple of things that it needs to sort out, Culloden and Loch Loma. We need to see these two issues resolved to the satisfaction of the people whose land it is. The land of Culloden belongs to the nation, the land around Loch Lomond belongs to the people of Scotland as well. And yet we are allowing developers to come in and make money out of it and to build across it. And the last thing we want is for Loch Lomond to turn into a theme park. I know people have said it's not going to be a theme park, but there are going to be water shoots and outdoor flumes. There will be other attractions built before you know it. It will be a theme park. It's just the company getting its foot in the door and getting a bit of free land to do what it likes with. Culloden, on the other hand, is another method of people getting wealthy for nothing, basically. They buy a bit of land that nobody wanted on a, on a boggy moor and drain it and turn it into luxury housing and make millions of pounds. But is that what we want to do with a battlefield site with a mass grave? Is that really what you want to do with it? because most people I've spoken to and the folk who have come on the show and made comments about this are all dead against it. Anyway, that's today's Indy Car. I'll be back again tomorrow, hopefully. Uh, at the more regular time, it's difficult for me to tell when exactly I'm going to transmit these shows because my work schedule changes every single day. But I will try and make another show tomorrow morning for you. There are plenty more things happening that I haven't had a chance to include in today's programme. Anyway, as usual, uh, give me a shout if you have any other newsworthy items. I have a few other um, events that I want to remind you about later on in the week that are being organised by the independence movement and various people for charities as well. There are a lot of different events coming up and I'll try and plug all of those throughout the rest of the week. Anyway, have a good week and I will catch up with you all tomorrow. Bye for now.